Well, good afternoon and welcome. Um, we have what I expect will be an interesting, exciting panel to discuss uh, changing perceptions of jury service. Um, uh, before I start with that, I just want to welcome you to Aaron Fox. We're, we're quite excited about our new space and we've been using it a fair amount. This actually originally was just going to be dead space over a loading dock. And one of our partners, who I guess is adept at reading plans, uh, saw that uh, and said, wait a second, I think we can do something with this. And as a result, we have this uh, wonderful auditorium here. Our, our panelists today, starting on my, my left, first Paulette Chapman, a partner at the law firm of Kuntz McKenney and a CCE board uh, director and an experienced civil litigator. Uh, in the center, the Honorable Royce Lamberth, Chief Judge of the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. And finally, uh, Professor Andrew Ferguson, Professor of Law at the David Clark School of Law at the University of the District of Columbia. I'm not going to do much more in terms of introducing uh, the panel members. I think that they're probably well known to you. But if you want to read a little bit more, there is a, a brief biographical uh, description at the uh, back of the meeting packet that you have today. Uh, unfortunately, Chief Judge Satterfield of the DC Superior Court was unable to be with us today. After the panel discussion, we hope to be able to have uh, some questions from the audience, so you might be thinking of uh, what uh, questions you have for the panel. Issues relating to jury service have been an evergreen issue for the Council of Court Excellence since its formation in 1982, and you heard a little bit about that already. CCE's jury work has been extensive and far-reaching. Uh, it successfully advocated the one-day, one-trial legislation to Congress for the Superior Court. And as a resident of the district, having been on three juries, I'm eternally grateful for that. Uh, it's nice to know you go down there and uh, either you're released or at least you're not going to be sitting around for a two-week or longer period. Uh, we are promoting changes to the Pettit and Grand Jury Systems. Uh, we're very active in educating D.C. students about their future roles as jurors holding annual jury service appreciation campaigns and recommending ways to improve the ways in which courts summon people to jury duty. The Council intends to return to the jury issue of the jury system uh, reform through a project that you will hear about at the end of today's panel. Uh, so why we focus on these issues at the present time? Uh, public reaction in popular media and press to jury service is often, if not overwhelmingly, negative. Uh, the perception is hardly new. Jury service is a burden involving a lot of waiting and doing nothing. It's something to be avoided and by extension is something that bears little connection to everyday life. However, we, we know that jury service can be a powerful experience for citizens that sit on a jury. It has important roots in our constitutional democracy. Uh, both of these elements are addressed in Professor Ferguson's new book, Why Jury Duty Matters, A Citizen's Guide to Constitutional Action. And I'm going to depart from the script here and put in a little plug for the book. Uh, it is available from Amazon. Uh, you can get it either as a traditional book. I downloaded it uh, to my iPad as a Kindle book. Uh, and it uh, is, was written for the citizen in mind. It's a very readable book, and I encourage you each to, uh, to buy it or to borrow it. Uh, based on the panelists' experience, we will discuss their perspectives in relation to these three themes. Uh, the relevancy of juries to our justice system, perspectives about citizens' interest in the jury system, and the district's changing demographics, and what that might mean for jury service. So the first panel we have, oh, first question we have for the panel is, is jury service still relevant? First major theme. And let me start with uh, Professor Ferguson. Can you uh, briefly discuss your motivation in writing your book and the public's response to it? Thank you. It is a great honor to be here, a great pleasure to talk about my favorite subject, the jury. For nine years, I was a trialer in D.C. Superior Court in front of some of you. I now teach and research and do work on the jury, and I am a self-proclaimed jury evangelical. I believe in a pure jury. I believe in a powerful jury, and I want more people to see the world as I see it. I wrote this book because for nine years, I walked into D.C. Superior Court, and I walked past that jury waiting room, and I saw the same expressions on people's faces. You know the expressions. That frustration, that boredom, that anxiousness, that dread even of people sitting there. And then I got to meet those same jurors after their service. 
The nice thing about DC Superior Court is you can meet the jurors. The judges invite you to go talk to the jurors. And I saw how jury service was a transformative experience for many of them. I saw how these people had come together, worked with people they would never otherwise meet in life, and be able to solve a difficult problem they didn't think they would be able to solve. And they did it in a way that when they left, they were proud of it. And I realized that that message of the positive part of jury service wasn't getting out there. It was being drowned out by the negative. But more importantly, I realized that jurors weren't seeing all of the constitutional principles and values that are built within jury, the jury system. Participation, deliberation, equality, fairness, accountability, liberty, the common good, they're all right there in jury service. And jurors, as they sat there doing their crosswords board, were missing them. And so I wrote this book to get them to see the constitutional connection. I want people to see that jury duty is constitution duty. It is a way for ordinary citizens to connect to the principles of the Constitution and then take jury service as something incredibly meaningful. Is it still relevant? Yes, it's as relevant as it was when the, the right to a jury trial came over on those first boats to Jamestown. It's been relevant every day since we've had it, and it's relevant because ordinary citizens can live the Constitution. It's the closest many American citizens get to the Constitution. You don't actually have to vote. You don't have to make enough money to pay your taxes. But when summoned, you have to show up there, and you have to do your job. And I want people to see it as an important an honorable, a valuable, and most importantly, a meaningful experience. So I want people to see that relevance. I want people to see uh, that goal. Professor Ferguson, and apart from the constitutional issues, how, how important is the jury system to our system of justice, do you think? I think it's critical. I mean, every single day, and most of you all you know this, right? Every single day, the ordinary citizens resolving the hardest questions. The easy cases get decided, right? They're settled or they're plied out. The hard questions get decided by jurors who have to sit there and wrestle with these difficult issues and they see it. So as a practical matter, matter it's incredibly important. As a symbolic matter, it's even more important because symbolically those individuals are our democracy, right? We are a self-government. We got to do something. We got to work. We got to participate. And jury service is an example that gives ordinary people something to do. And it's concrete, it's easy, and it brings up all these wonderful constitutional principles. Participation. You actually got to go do it. Deliberation. We want a system that resolves conflict through reasoned debate. Equality, that whole one person, one vote thing, actually means something when you're one of 12. Fairness, all the rules of trial from voir dire to the confrontation clause are all about fairness. All these principles are there. The accountability, the community, the civic virtue that you need in jury service, and yet people aren't seeing it. When they get that summons, they think, oh, today I got a waste in court. Instead of seeing it as some uh, a po positive opportunity, you know, in the, my book I say, you know, when you receive that jury summons in the mail, it's an invitation. It's an invitation to participate in self-government. And you should view it as that. Don't view it as a one day that you have to not work. View it as a one day you have to be a citizen. Okay, thank you. Let me turn to Chief Judge Lamberth, and I'll ask basically the same question. How important, from your judicial perspective, is jury service to the functioning of the justice system? Uh, could, could, you real, could not you and the other judges reach equally supportable decisions much easier and faster than juries do? Well, I'm sure we all I'm sure we all think we're smarter than jury and we could do it better, but in truth, it would not have the acceptance of the public that juries do have. And, and there is some mystique about how 12 people, or in a civil case less, but some number of people come together and slug it out until they get to a verdict that may or may not be compromised. But it's going to be thoroughly debated and thoroughly decided, and there's something about that process that gives most people a feeling that they had a fair shot. And with a single judge, people don't always have that notion. Uh, so I'm very comfortable with jury service, and, and the juries that I have, I've just had an extraordinary experience that I almost never disagree with, with the verdict in my cases. I've been maybe fortunate, because I know some judges don't have that experience. And even when I disagree with the verdict, I, I can always see the rationale for why they reached the verdict they did, why they came to the conclusion they did. So that I think we're very fortunate this country to have jurors who are conscientious, who are dedicated, who are willing to do it. You do have this problem that the professor talks about, about a general reluctance. I think it's stronger in DC than some places because people get called so often here. 
it's not unusual for people to be called every two or three years back for jury service. There's nowhere else in the country that you would be called that often for jury service. So it's a unique situation in D.C., and some people don't like that. But those who serve, as the professor says, are always proud of their service. They're always proud of what they've done. They're always proud of the verdict they've reached. And I really have not had a problem with hung juries either. So once in a while they happen, but they're still aberrations. In almost every case, we get a verdict. We get a verdict that the public is going to accept better, I think, than they would if it was a judge decision, especially on some of the most controversial cases. And I think it shows the genius of our founders that, that this is the way that our founders decided to go. I suppose, too, the, the jury does take off some of the burden from the judiciary and that you don't need to uh, write up those nasty findings of fact and conclusions of law as you would in a, in a non-bench a bench case. I, I think that's right, although uh, you have to do some work on jury instructions, and that's how the Court of Appeals likes to pick apart what you've done. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Basically the same question, Paula Chapman, let me ask you, you come to it as a, a civil litigator. Is the jury system important to, to your practice in the justice system, and why or why not? Uh, well, first of all, it's pretty daunting being <laughs> unable to turn this on. <laughs> being before a group of uh, attorneys and judges who have years and years of experience before uh, juries. And it's so, it's so nice to see you, Chief Judge King, in particular. I haven't seen you. I've been, appeared before you often. Um, the, how could jury service not be important? Um, and therefore, lawyers and their clients, there is nothing more fascinating than the jurors. You know, I have yet to find the right, uh, I, you know, to sell the soul or to find the potion where I can read their minds or be a fly on the wall at some point during the trial. So it begs the question, really, in our system, how could they not be so relevant? Without juries, what would access to court mean? What does it mean? We, we'll talk a lot about it from the perspective of jurors. And I like that um, Professor Ferguson, in his book, he has a cool quote. It says, uh, serving as a juror is one of the last unifying acts of citizenship. Um, from the perspective of the litigant, and the chief uh, referenced this, you know, it's their, uh, their participation uh, in jury services, their ability and their right to help select the, their peers. And win, lose, or otherwise, uh, there is a sense not just for the public, but for that particular party, that litigant, that they've had six, eight, 12 people from the community, some with experiences like their own, make a decision about their case. There's no blue ribbon panel that's been pre-selected. There's been no judge shopping that's made decisions about both the facts and the law. So it may be an imperfect system, but um, another thing that you know was interesting to me was how unique the United States is in terms on the civil side, which is you know my bent of um, how our country has the most civil jury trials among all. And I thought that was a, a remarkable tie back, of course, to our Constitution, where we are, are all rooted. Let me uh, turn to the second theme, and that is uh, how do citizens perceive jury service? <clears throat> and I think Judge Lambert touched on this a little bit in the uniqueness of, uh, of the District of Columbia. So uh, my question for Chief Judge Lambert is, has citizens' engagement or uh, their interest in jury service changed over the years, uh, viewed from your years on the bench and as chief judge? Well, it worries me because as we no longer teach civics in high schools in this country and we teach to the test and all the things we do, it worries me as young people come along that they don't really understand the, the construct. Sorry, sorry. Young people as they come along don't really understand the construct of our system of government, of our, of, of the jury itself. And since 
most schools are no longer teaching civets. There's very little in our educational system that is going to prepare our young citizens to become jurors. And, and it worries me. So I think I say to my judges and, and other judges, every time we get a chance, we need to work with groups of students, of young people, of others, to encourage them to do mock trials, to do, to look at how the system works, because our future jurors are these young people. And we've got to worry about whether they understand the role of jury service, what, how important it is for our country to have good jurors who are conscientious, who are willing to do their job as good as citizens, who are willing to show up and be good citizens and serve as jurors. And we really have to, I have a great concern that the future of our country uh, is at risk uh, as we no longer prepare people to be good citizens when they gain majority and start being called for jury service, and especially those who correctly figure out that they don't really have to show and nothing happens. So then we're having a more limited pool of people that actually are serving. What what can the court do about that latter problem? Because I, I do hear about that. That's well, we bad we have we have thought about whether we want to do an order to show cause why you shouldn't be held in contempt and order you down and fine you fifty dollars and things. Um, the lawyers frequently wonder about the efficacy of that. Do you really want that person on your jury if we get them down there, uh, who was so anxious to not serve? And uh, so we have. I think we've been of a mixed view. And we really haven't done much. I think Super Court has done a little more than we have occasionally uh, tightening up, but we have not done much in terms of, of trying to hold people accountable. We have the tools. We have the power. It's a question of whether we want to exercise that. And, and I prefer uh, educational programs in other ways rather than the coercive power, but there may come a point when we need to use at least once a year for two weeks, uh, send out an order to show cause to everybody that doesn't show up for a two-week period and, and let the newspapers have a field day and see what happens. But well, for the that's time just being, in the back of my mind. <laughs> Judge King. Experience in super court, as Judge Lambert said, uh, with uh, the, the uh, concept that jury service in it starts with the concept that jury services we don't have the draft anymore so it's about the only thing as a citizen that you have to do the, the, the law says you have to do it so what happens is for people who don't show up they're called in to come in on a friday morning and explain why they didn't show up uh it's become sort of a pattern now they show up they say, oh my gosh, I forgot, or I was on the way to the hospital, or, you know, it, it, it's very rare that you really get someone. The only people who think they shouldn't have to be jurors are students. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, since they're learning anyway, I give them an education. <laughs> so they, get, they get that. But then uh, for, uh, invariably then people say for whatever reason i'm sorry i didn't make it you just pick a date well, okay come come on a date let's make it at your convenience but you come and you'll serve on a jury then so that takes care of that for the people who don't show up for that i issue bench warrants and uh <clears throat> to my surprise the first couple of times i did that i had half a dozen people in the cell block on Monday morning. Uh, the marshals actually did get around to serve them. And I knew that it was working when a cab driver told me, boy, you know, in D.C., you better do what the jury service says. <laughs> I knew I was getting it. So uh, I do issue bench warrants if they're, they're, it's rare, but if they are in fact arrested, then they come in and Okay, you've spent the night in jail. Now maybe you understand. Will you pick a date? And they always do. So it's very, it's, it's become, uh, the, the mechanism is there to hold them in contempt, but you never do. You just get them in and they, 
oh, I see, I understand now. It isn't something that I could just sort of have car trouble and not make. I have to get and as far as I know, the press hasn't had the field day with that yet. I don't, I don't <laughs> no, no. Uh, no, not. Well, we'll, uh, we'll try to keep that a secret in the room here today. Let me uh, ask uh, Paula Chapman, what are your perceptions about how interest in the jury system may have changed, if at all? For example, is it harder or easier to uh, pick a jury than it was, you know, a number of years ago, 10, 15 years? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't think it's harder to pick a jury than it used to be. Um, I think the expectations and the changing um, landscape of where we pull jurors from um, has changed how we um, present to them. I think their expectations have changed. The advocacy that um, you uh, present to this, uh, the current uh, generation of jurors is, is different. Um, they uh, are impatient. They want a lot of visuals, right, left, and center, as much as possible. Um, you uh, need to figure out a way. Fairness is defined as appealing to a rule that's broken, something that wasn't followed, a guideline that you know kept slipping or being missed. Um, fairness is not uh, only and um, solely focused on uh, eliciting their emotion. Um, they, uh, the preparations that attorneys do, knowing that there are issues, the most significant change is, will they do research on the internet? How will you fashion a jury instruction to address it? How will you monitor it if you ever could? Uh, do you take your website down? It's the tactics of how you appear and present your case going into it that lawyers talk about um, because we know that it's just a very changed uh, look. Their expectations, what defines convenience for the jurors. Note taking looks almost quaint. Um, and I mean, honestly, thanks to the, I have it with me still because Dwight and I, uh, we teach uh, for nine, 11 years or so a jury selection class for the DC bar, and it's really about deselecting because that's the only power you have. But we bring our juries uh, for the year 2000, and we talk from it for part of part of that. But what's defined as convenience for the jurors is very much um, changing. What you have to do for them, it's almost inexcusable to. Um, uh, be able to uh, keep them in a, a room for a full day while you argue jury instructions. Um, you know, that's just a, it's a totally something you want to avoid. Um, so I've seen that a lot of changes there. Professor Ferguson, in preparing and writing your book, what, what did you learn about how citizen interests and values about jury service have changed over uh, recent years? Well, I think that, you know, most jurors who receive that jury summons who haven't ever served approach it with a level of dread. I think most jurors who have actually served appreciate it. And I think fundamentally both those who have served and those who haven't served somewhat misunderstand it. And so I want to throw out a somewhat provocative idea, because what's the fun of having a room filled with the smartest lawyers in Washington and not be able to provoke them? But to say that there is, uh, jurors now see themselves very task-oriented, right? You get your jury summons and you show up to the court, you go to the courthouse, it's one case, one day. And no longer, and jurors no longer see that being a juror is part of their political identity. Now, if you go back to the history of the founding, being a juror was part of your political identity. You had the twin political rights of voting and jury service. You trace the post-reconstruction civil rights movement and you see that the move to have all people and all races on juries wasn't because you could have better fact finders, but because serving on a jury meant something. It meant something to be part of a full citizen, an equal citizen. Charles Hamilton Houston wins his first case in the Supreme Court on a jury discrimination case. Again, not because, not just because they would be 
all people would be a better fact finder, but because it meant something. The women's suffrage movement was even clearer, where they rec the women, the advocates of the women's suffrage movement recognized if you only had the right to vote and not the right to sit on a jury, not the right to do the work of a jury, you wouldn't be treated as an equal citizen. We've lost that idea. We've lost that idea that being a juror is an identity. We think of it as a temp job, not an identity. J being a juror is something you do, not something you are. And I think if you broaden that, the, the idea that being a juror means something, it means something before, it means something after, after. I mean, to piggyback on what uh, Chief Judge Lambert said, you know, we require people to do more to adopt a pet in Washington, D.C. than to serve on a jury and decide someone whether they go to jail for the rest of their lives or a company goes bankrupt, right? We don't do any pre-training. We don't do any idea. And it's, it borders on irresponsible that there's no civic I in information so that when people sit down and they are truly the blank slate, not the good kind of blank slate where they're an open mind, but they're a blank slate, they have no idea why they're there or what the importance is, it borders on being dangerous. And I think, you know, Chief, the Chief Judge and other, some of the Supreme Court justices have gone around the country to say, you know, civic, the lack of civic literacy and constitutional liter literacy is one of the most dangerous things in America, because if you don't understand why there's a court system, you don't understand why there's a jury, you don't buy into the verdicts that come from that, and this whole system gets delegitimized. So I think we as a system, we as a court system, need to do a better job of contextualizing what the jury is, why we have this rather odd system, right? Twelve random strangers come in and decide a case. It is sort of odd, and you need to do a better job, we need to do a better job, of explaining why we have it so when jurors get that summons in the mail, they are able to perceive it in a way that this is a positive opportunity, they have some sense, some grounding of what they're going to do. And finally, that it doesn't just end. D.C. is a wonderful experiment. Almost everyone, if you live in D.C., you're going to have the opportunity to serve pretty regularly. That summons is going to come in the mail, and yet we treat people, we treat jurors as if it's the only time they'll ever get it. We don't recognize that they, this is, you know, along the continuum of your civic life, you will have this opportunity over and over and over again, and we can learn from it. We can find best practice. We can do things, but we as a, a legal system don't look at it. So I think you can change the way jurors perceive jury service by sort of broadening into this sort of political identity, constitutional identity, uh, that would change the way, that change the way jurors see it. Okay, thank you. I'm glad I'm not your court reporter, Professor. <laughs> I've, I've been shut down many a time. Say, slow down, Mr. Ferguson, slow down. <laughs> well, I think we have, uh, we have contrasts up here on the panel. Uh, let me uh, turn to the uh, third theme that we have, and this is really a, a theme that, a question for the, the panel just generally, that is, what might changing demographics mean for, for the jury service? Uh, increasingly, the District of Columbia has seen in the last 10 to 15 years significant demographic shifts, changes in racial and cultural diversity, a greater income disparity, an influx of younger uh, people, an influx of single people, and greater proportions of dual income families. So uh, I'll just throw this one open for the panel to discuss, and, and I guess the first question I have is, have you seen this demographic shift? play out on actual jury panel demographics in, in recent years, say, uh, in this uh, millennium? Well, there's no question that we're seeing different complexions of juries. We're seeing many more juries with very sophisticated college degrees. I'll have a jury of 12 and frequently have four with masters, six total with college degrees out of 12. I mean, it's a different sort, but the, the people who are moving into D.C., are more young singles than young couples, but young people moving into D.C. that are educated, that are making good salaries, that are showing up for jury duty and, and appearing, but it's really changing the demographics of the juries that we see. I, I do see, and I'm enthused about the ones I do see up here that seem to be conscientious and that want to do the right thing. They are, um, lawyers have to learn though that jurors are impatient, uh, they see no read. I mean, lawyers for years would read depositions with somebody on the stand and some paralegal reading the answers, and jurors can't stand that. I mean, they've, they've seen on TV that you can play a deposition on video. They don't understand. I mean, they'll complain to me at the break. Why don't those lawyers do videos, you know? And I mean, jurors just are a different sort of breed now, and jurors have more expectations of what lawyers should be doing than jurors 20 years ago. It's a real different thing that jurors want the lawyers to be doing. In terms of jury comprehension, the difference that the video has made is incredible. Uh, the document the witness is reading from on the stand used to, if you were lucky, you could get 12 copies and pass them around. And 
the person in the jury box could look and see as the witness. Now they've got it on the screen. They can see what the witness is saying. They can see the actual wording. Juror comprehension, I'm sure, is much greater now than it was 20 years ago because they can see the document as the witness is testifying about it. It, it really makes a huge difference. And that's what jurors want, you know. I mean, if they're going to get into it, they want to get into it. And they really don't have a lot of patience for lawyers. Well, let the lawyer say something here for a minute. <laughs> well, actually, I was going to ask you next, Paulette. So go ahead, please. Um, I think that ties in with this idea of how do, you know, modern day citizens perceive jury service. And I've been thinking about it. And we know the old adage is, oh my God, they hate it. They reluctant. They, you know, they dread it. Um, I think it's a little bit of a mixed bag because I see the overlay of um, cultural influences. Uh, you know, never have we had um, a time when the citizen is more exposed, good, bad, or indifferent. And we know on TV they're perfect. All those lawyers and the judges and the jurors are perfectly scripted and perfectly written. We've never had a time culturally when the average citizen is more exposed to juries of every ilk, real juries, uh, Judge Judy juries, um, you know, TV juries. So this idea of jury service I do think it's a little interwoven, and maybe it's an idea. Maybe it's an issue of branding. You know, it's a consumer product. Our justice system and service and serving as a juror. Uh, you know, it's tying it to the Constitution. But you do not have a body politic that's afraid um, or reluctant to be viewed as judges. Not when you have, as long as it's easy for them. Not when you have millions of people, they're more than happy to participate in judging Dancing with the Stars or American <laughs> Idol. I mean, it's, it's a, a little superficial in the analogy, but it's not a landscape that's rural with people spread out. And I don't think we're inter, uh, we're not accounting for the influences from the very things that the juries expect us to do. Uh, the TV, the uh, of of how that impacts jury service. When why we do mock um, trials in my law firm, the mock jurors they love it. They they get into it as the chief said. They um, love the power of participation. So this idea of how citizens perceive jury service, I think, is much more complicated. And I don't think we can rest on the old saw that. You know, they, they simply dread it, and we have to make sure there's, you know, milk and cookies in the, in the jury room. Professor Ferguson, um, in researching your book, did you uh, uh, uncover any effects of these changes in the demographic shifts that we've talked about on how juries are functioning, specifically in the District of Columbia, too? You know, I didn't focus uh, on D.C. I think everyone knows the demographic shifts in D.C. have had an effect on the jury pool, at least in terms of race. Uh, there are certainly a, uh, as the uh, population has gotten to be less African American and more Latino and more white, uh, there has been a corresponding shift. I, I candidly didn't notice in my practice, I only practiced for nine years, and I'm not quite as young as I look, but I, I know many of you have been practicing a lot longer and probably can talk about the you know, archetype DC jury, which actually meant something at a time. Uh, and I think that's cha that has changed. Uh, I always found what was fascinating was that most juries that I ended up with were a wonderful cross-section of DC. Uh, it really was true diversity of uh, that almost broke down, uh, at least on Afro-American white lines, almost to the, the proportion of the uh, the actual demographics. Uh, I, I don't know if that will continue to change, uh, and I don't have really the statistics. I know the courts have the, the statistics on it. I, I do think it's an interesting question about um, the age demographics or the comfort with technology. I was having a conversation with a former federal judge last week, who so now teaches law, uh, and, uh, you know, she was talking about that there's, that what's odd is that in many places, D.C. Superior Court's a good example, 
the way lawyers practice hasn't changed for three or four decades, right? We still use the whiteboards. You know, some of the U.S. attorneys might have their PowerPoints, but it's not even like what the federal court has. And you're not allowed to use your iPads. I actually was watching to see how many of you were checking your Blackberries and everything, because we're so used to multitasking, right? You're in this thing, someone's talking at you, and you want to check the other 16 things that are going on in your lives. And most jurors are those people, right? They're used to being able to do three things at once. And one of the odd things about being in a jury trial is you're required to do one thing. And not only are you just only required to do one thing, process it that way, you're not allowed to go ask Google for the answer to everything, right? Which you are in your normal life. And further, when you're in that deliberation room, you're not allowed to do anything but sit and resolve a single problem. Think about in your life the last time you were locked in a room and told to answer a question before you could leave it. Right? It's actually a great motivational focus why people do well in exams and those kinds of things because they have to do it. They're required to be there. Um, but most jurors, when they enter jury service, they forget that they are in a different environment. They forget that they are in a no iPad environment. And the question is whether courts should embrace that, say, oh, this is special. This is different. This is something that you will do that's unlike anything else you do in your life, and that's important and it's something to be skilled, or whether we embrace it and say, well, we'll be able to bring in some of these other um, principles. But it's a conflict, as I'm sure, you know, if you watch any jury waiting room, every almost every single person is on their smartphone. Uh, and if you watch what jurors want to do as they're fidgeting uh, in trial, they really want to check to see if they got the latest Twitter update of whatever was going on. Chief Judge Lamberth, do, do uh, any of these demographic or, or style changes affect the way in which you have to do your job when you're uh, working with a jury? Well, the one thing we have to do as judges is make sure they don't get these outside influences. So I try to appear to be the total buffoon. I don't understand Twitter and all these things. So I say to the jurors, you can't do any of this stuff. And I pretend to, to not understand Twitter and all these things that all you young people do. But just don't get on them. Don't talk to anybody about the case. Don't You can't talk to your family about the case, but don't twix anybody about the case or Twitter or any of those kind of things. And, and But I repeat it before lunch. I say, don't do this during the lunch break. At the end of the day, I say again now, remember what I said about Twitter and Twix and all those things. And, you know, I, I try to play it that way, but I constantly reinforce that we don't want them doing those. And, and I say to them when I give that first instruction, which I, I use a judicial conference approved form so the Court of Appeals will know I've said all the right wording, but uh, I always do say that it has caused mistrials where you violate this instruction. So this is one of the most important instructions I'm going to give you about don't let anybody uh, and don't do any independent research and don't go look in Google. Now, in a sense, you're, it's like a red flag in front of a bull that go look in Google, but <laughs> I try. <laughs> I actually, the, uh, my follow-up question was, in your experience, how often does it come to your attention that a juror has gone ahead and done their own research through one of the social very media. And one of very rare, but that's because I say it at least twice a day. And so if, if it's going to happen, they're probably not going to report it. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Paul, has, has, uh, has these demographic shifts changed the ways in which uh, you deal with a jury, other than the things you talk about in terms of presentation? Less verbosity. OK. Well, on that note, maybe we'll move on to the, uh, the, the last, uh, last topic, and that is uh, for each of the panelists, if you could do one thing to improve the jury system, and I'm going to try to limit you to one, uh, or change perceptions of it, uh, what would you do? And uh, let me start with Professor Ferguson this time. I would want to rebrand it, to use your term, that jury duty is constitution duty, meaning everything in that word, right? The reason you get that jury summons is not because the chief judge of a court asked you to come serve. It's because the Constitution gives you that right and responsibility. And if you see it as a citizen's right, it comes from the citizen, it becomes more powerful. If it's seen as constitutional, it becomes more foundational, right? Everyone claims they die for the Constitution, though no one has actually read the Constitution. But everyone believes in the Constitution. If you constitutionalize something, it becomes more powerful, it becomes more sense. And the Constitution also requires an educated populace. And so I think we can use jury service as the time during those 
eight hours, whatever you have to be there during one day, one trial, to educate citizens about why this system matters. Maybe why larger government projects matter. Now, I was talking to a jury commissioner out in Columbus, Ohio, and he says, and they have a, a, a week-long system, but he gives them tours of the courthouse. He shows them how the jury wheel works so they don't think it's some random number of why they were picked every two years. He even, get this, I know this would never work in D.C., at the end of their service gives them a tour of the jail so they can see their tax dollars at work. And their jury, jury yields are in the 90s. Our jury yields in DC, I believe, are in the 20s, although I'm not really saying that. But they really are low. And that's a waste of stamps. That's a waste of money. That's a waste of time and effort. And we can do something better. I understand the, the stick of contempt. But I think there, there are some carrots out there that we can use to sort of, again, reconceptualize, reframe how jury service is seen so it becomes something patriotic even, something important. I don't mean to be naive about it, but right now it seems it seems rather negative. So if you can find some positive silver lining of it, you might be able to get jurors to say, you know, this will be my day to be a citizen. That's a great thing. It's why people wear those I voted stickers. We need to have little I served on jury service stickers, or the equivalent. Thank you. Paula Chapman. Um, clean up the list, get rid of bad addresses. Um, monitor it and, and give the money for our courts to be able to do that, perhaps expand that list. Okay. Chief Judge Lamberth? I, I think that's important and what we have done in, in, you know, in this time of sequestration, I don't know if we'll be able to do it next year, but we are working. We've hired an independent contractor to try to do something about the list and the addresses because, you know, you send an awful lot of summons out and you get returns of not at this address and you know, it's very difficult to have current addresses. People do move a lot in DC and, and so there's a lot of turnover. And that is a problem. There are a lot of, there are a lot of little tinkering things. I like what the professor said about a long range strategy. I like what I said, obviously, about civics and, and trying to educate the younger, but there are a lot of little tinkering things that I think we could do to make jury service for those who don't get on the juries for the pool to be not as unattractive as it seems to be to many people. So, for example, I think in our own court we need to work better on pooling juries so that we, we sort of leave now to each judge to set the time they want to start their trial. And if we have three jur judges set 10 a.m. Monday for trials, then we're going to call in 150 jurors. If, if we could get one of those judges to set it for 1.30 p.m., we could call in less jurors and have some left over. Our judges have not really been willing to give a little on those kinds of issues. Uh, and, you know, there are issues like that that we need as a court to work on to try to help. Uh, and I, that's one reason when CCE first talked to me about the possibility of updating the jury study from 20 years ago or whatever it is, that I think it's a good idea. I think there are a lot of things we probably could do that would make jury service more attractive, and I think we need to make it more attractive to make people not as concerned as the process professor says about having to come down to this drudgery. The, the jurors who get on juries almost always have a complete changeover. But, but we're turning away a lot of people, and they're going away with the feeling that they wasted a day for nothing. Okay. And that's, that's not a perception we want them to go away with. Thank you, Judge Lamerth. I, I promised time for audience questions. We have a room full of lawyers. I'm, I'm sure I can get at least one or two questions. Yes, please. Uh, pretty much every meeting of trial lawyers that you attend contains some discussion of what's referred to as a vanishing jury trial. Um, and this is typically attributed to the impact of the federal sentencing guidelines or to the increasing cost of having to try a case before a jury. And I'm just wondering, what the panel thinks about that, whether that is a phenomenon, and if so, what might be done about it? I think it's true. I mean, we're trying many less cases. Uh, I have a lot of days where I've set trials and they settle or plead at the last minute, and, and I'm then working on summary judgment or something else. Uh, and I'm trying less cases than I was 20 years ago. Uh, part of it is the expense on the civil side. Part of it is the guidelines make more certain uh, what's going to happen on the criminal side, and, and you better work your deal with the prosecutor to get the guidelines where you can live with them. Uh, so I, I think it's the nature of the beast is far different, but we are definitely seeing a vanishing number of trials. 
Professor Ferguson? I think empirically there's no question. You can just look at it. The Supreme Court cited, you know, in criminal cases it's over 95 percent get settled and pleas. Uh, that has to do with the effect of the sentencing guidelines. It has to do with the motivations of the parties and, you know, your responsibilities to your client. Uh, I think one thing that's not looked at is that, you know, one of the realities why it's easier to chip away at juries is that there's no lobby for jurors, right? There's no organized body of jurors that would ever protest for the right to serve more. I mean, that might be a difficult lobby to establish anyway, but there really is no collective organization. It's done through proxies of courts or trial bars or the rest who see an interest of jurors. But there isn't a sense of, hey, wait a minute, this is my civic right being taken away. Hey, I want to serve. And again, the handful of people who that would fit on, uh, fit in, you know, might be, might be limited. But there really is no pushback because it becomes in the interests of most of the parties. And again, as difficult as it is, I mean, your job is easier in some way. It's, it's only judges get off the bench earlier. Their lawyers get to work on their other cases since there's more cases. And all those things are factors into why the system continues. And it's a complicated question. But there's no body that's pushing for juror rights and juror claims and juror uh, involvement and engagement. And I think that's part of why it's so easy to push back. And it's been a long pushback. It's been decades that we've been pushing back, so in the civil context, uh, and more so more recently in the criminal context, of a, a lack of, of juries. And so, you know, again, you might sense the theme of my work here of trying to mobilize those citizens like the founders who said we're going to go to a war of independence because the right to a jury trial is being taken away from us. We put in our Declaration of Independence, we put it twice in our Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and to have people sort of connect to that constitutional history, that constitutional moment, uh, and have them engage the idea of maybe there's something valuable about this system we call the jury. Paula Chapman, have you seen uh, fewer jury trials in your practice? Yes, um, but for lots of reasons. Uh, so I think it's, uh, I think the question's complex enough and it would be worth uh, the, the, the study. Why in this jurisdiction, in any area of practice, criminal, civil, are there fewer and fewer jury trials? Um, what does that mean about uh, how we define access to the courthouse? Um, is it the, um, the growth exponentially in the past 15 years of, of very good, very experienced um, sources for mediation? The growth of arbitration clauses agreed to or fought against, the, uh, and I'm not a criminal uh, lawyer, but the sentencing guidelines. I think it'd be very interesting, not to mention that there is no voice, there is no um, you know, we should all belong to your church and be that evangelistic. But there isn't um, an appreciation for what it means to have that access to jurors, not just the judge. And um, once it's gone or diminished, is, is that a problem? I think we're at a good point where that would be worth really looking at. Well, let me, let me throw out my own follow-up. Is the vanishing jury trial something we should be really concerned about, uh, Chief Judge Lambert? I find that hard to, to really evaluate as a judge because I'm prejudiced in favor of my system as opposed to arbitration or some of the other things that people opt for now. So I don't really, I'm, I don't know enough about ultimate results from arbitration and whether people feel they've been fairly treated and gotten fair results or whether it's just something they can live with and it costs a lot less than going to trial. So I don't, I don't really have a good feel for how to evaluate that. I want at the end of the court system for people to feel like they had their day in court, they got a shot, whether well, they won or lost, we want them to go away with the feeling that they had a good shot at getting justice and fairness. That's how we want our system to be perceived. We're a public institution, we're accountable to the public, we want the public to have confidence that that's what we're trying to do. Arbitration doesn't have that they have a goal of just settling it, ending it one way or another. And there are, there are advantages to that, but as a system for a whole society, I don't think arbitration is where we want to go. But, but that's where we're going, clearly. Professor Ferguson, do you want to weigh in on that? You know, I think if you look at it 
not in the instrumental way of resolving cases, but the value of the jury to society. I'm certainly not the first person to say that the process or the experience of serving a jury can teach really valuable lessons. You know, Alexis de Tocqueville talks about that a jury is the free public school to teach the skills of democracy. Why? Because in order to have a democracy, in order to have a representative democracy, you got to have citizens who understand what's going on. You got to have citizens who want to be engaged. There's an interesting uh, project out in Washington State to track to see whether people who serve on a jury are more engaged civically, and it showed that they were statistically significant ways that if you had served on a criminal jury to verdict, you are more likely to go out and vote. You're more likely to go out and uh, participate in your local PTA and do all those things that we think is important for a vibrant you know, democracy and a community, right? That it's sort of this engagement idea that can happen. And I think that, that again, obviously people need to focus on the instrumental action of will this resolve a case? But there are other values that get missed in that, of what is the experience of jurors, what lessons, you know, many times, jurors are the only time an ordinary citizen gets to understand what the court system is, right? They read about it, they watch Judge Judy, which is not the way you want to uh, show <laughs> what the jury's, the court system is, and you want to have people come out leaving with respect. You know, think about how many people enter the court system who don't respect it or who have reasons to d disclaim and you want to sh prove them wrong and show that this is an important system. The system has gone back for centuries that works and it works because the citizens themselves are responsible and engaged in it. And we need to have more people experience that so they can go preach the gospel of the jury back to their communities and say, you know, you'll get a fair shake. There were 12 strangers who listened to my case, spent all week on my case. It was incredible. Who would have thought? You know, my clients were always shocked that anyone would spend that much time on their problems. All these strangers are here for me, and it was an amazing thing. So when the jury came back with the verdict, they understood it, and they said, oh, they cared. They thought about it. The system seemed to work, and it was this legitimizing function of it. And I think we miss that as we move to sort of private, you know, secret, ar not secret, but private arbitrations and ways of resolving things that are much quicker, much more uh, efficient, but lose some of the, the, the messages and the principles of our democratic system. Another question from the audience? I think we have time for one more. OK, well, I have a question. Um, in the recent Jody Arias trial, and I, I know uh, probably most of you know who that is, uh, in Arizona, the jury was permitted to ask questions of each witness under Arizona law. Uh, in writing, they were reviewed uh, and then posed by the judge. Uh, the jury asked the defendant, who testified, over 200 questions in the trial and had many, many questions of the expert witnesses that testified. A number of legal commentators thought that many of the jury's questions were actually better than those asked by the prosecution <laughs> or the course. defense. <laughs> um, so let me start with um, Chief Judge Lamberth. As a trial judge, how would you feel about having a jury question witnesses in, in this manner? Well, in criminal, I've never done it. I've told Reggie Walton, who does do it on our court, as soon as he gets affirmed in one of these, then I'll look at it. So uh, <laughs> that's where I still am. Uh, Reggie is a total believer. He believes that it keeps the juries more interested and attentive and that he can weed out the bad questions. And, and he's a big proponent of it. And I told him, as soon as he's affirmed, I'll try it. He must be a convert, because actually I was on a jury in his courtroom 20-some years ago, Superior Court, and we weren't asking questions back then. But, uh, <laughs> no, he does now. something new. Uh, Professor Ferguson? Well, a as a defense lawyer, I objected to the idea vehemently because I wanted control, and my obligation was to my client, and I wanted it as control. As someone who now studies it, I can see the value of having jurors engaged. I mean, it's sort of like if you were teaching a class and you didn't allow your students to ask questions, right? They're just not going to be as engaged. Many of you might have been a little bit more engaged in this panel because you knew you might get to ask a question at the end of it, right? It's just human nature. And I think that jurors offer a window into what's going on that's valuable for the lawyers. But more importantly, I think if you want to have citizens engaged in the process, it's a good way. There are many more ways to do it, but it's a good way to get jurors interested in what's going on and have a vested stake in it. And again, if the judge is going to actually, you know, call out the bad questions or call out the, the improper questions, I think it, it really does change it to a more interactive way. Again, from a defense perspective, I'm against it. From a scholar's perspective, I see its value. Right. Paula Chapman. Blessing and curse. <laughs> Maybe it's a blessing if it's allowed. And uh, by the way, culturally, I don't think that um, that trial 
should be the tail that wags the dog and gives guidance to the jurist out here on um, how many questions and how it should be controlled with all uh, respect to the, that trial judge in Arizona. Um, but it could be, um, of course, in the trenches viewpoint, um, it would be close to, but not quite, being the fly on the wall that I referenced earlier, in that you have questions of an expert um, or of a lay witness, and you get a sense, at least from, hopefully they're just written, although I was in uh, federal court recently, and the jurors were allowed to stand up and ask questions. That's Oh, wow. A different discussion, <laughs> but um, uh, it will give you the practitioner a sense. You're not waiting to get the final verdict to say, oh, geez, you know, why didn't we focus a little bit on proximate cause or this piece of evidence or that visual or, you know, clean up on uh, redirect this credibility thing that's been plaguing us forever. So I like that part of it. Um, the I wonder philosophically about what my role is um, and the judge's role and the juror's role when the lines uh, blend in, uh, in that our system, you know, we're advocates and with the judge and the rules and everything, we're supposed to be slicing and dicing and presenting and deciding um, how and what is relevant and in what fashion to lay it out. And I, I wonder about the jurors becoming, not having legal training and not having had the case for, you know, two, three years and not fought with everybody about everything and now being able to um, emphasize facts or a theory in a certain way. So um, I have, a, I think there's cautionary tales involved in the limits and how many questions do you get to ask and was it fair that they did this? So. Blessing and curse. <laughs> Chief Judge Lambert, I take it from Judge, Judge, King, oh, has... Judge King. I, I was just going to jump in because I heard, I think the professor said he was against it as a defense lawyer. Uh, I, I always did it, carefully screening the questions at the bench. So if there was something that was going to go in a bad direction, that got stopped. And the jury understood that and was explaining that. But what the advantage, it seems to me, that I can't imagine anybody being opposed to is you're presenting as a lawyer, you're presenting a case to these 12 blank faces. They're telling you what they're thinking. They're telling you what they don't understand. They're telling you what they missed. They're telling you what they think is important. They're giving you feedback during the trial. I, I think it's, I can't imagine not, not doing it. Otherwise, we stand there trying to read previews from the jurors' faces. Well, listen, I, I want to thank everyone again for the discussion. A big round of applause for the, for the panel. Thank you. You, you. you may have guessed from some of the earlier remarks that the subject and timing of this panel discussion was not an accident. It actually serves as a prelude and a kickoff to an important uh, CCE project. I'm pleased to announce on behalf of the Council that we are launching a comprehensive examination of the issues relating to the perceived burden of jury service in D.C. And as a blueprint, we're going to go back to our groundbreaking 1998 D.C. Jury Project Report, which had made 32 recommendations for improving D.C. Uh, jury service. Uh, the current project will not only cast a current eye on those recommendations, but also address issues that did not exist then, such as the potential of technology and social media to improve juror summoning and utilization and its potential to influence juror deliberation, some of the issues that we discussed today. The changing demographics of D.C. and who is being summoned for jury service and encouraging greater public understanding of and appreciation for jury service. Uh, CCE has a long history of looking at jury issues ranging from the 1998 report to being the primary advocate for the one day one trial system in D.C. Superior Court to our current jury school education program. Uh, we are currently putting together uh, the project committee and raising funds for the project. We plan to complete our work by the end of 2014. If you're interested in participating on this important project, I welcome you to contact the CCE staff or me. Uh, it's been a pleasure moderating today and with this excellent and distinguished panel. Uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you.